Friday night with a community family that's, that's engaging with us in the tent, or it's literally praying for people around the world and going to those people. Lord, whatever it is that you ask of us, may these dollars, these pennies, would they add up so that we may do that work faithfully. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, guys are taking up their offering. I want to invite this good-looking dude, Eric, to the stage. This is Eric Van Patten. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can call for him. Is your wife going to come up here? No, we'll Do we just have point to? her out. Okay, There's, we'll just point uh, her out. We're going to sing about. We'll have you stand, baby. Stand back there, yeah, darling. So that's my beautiful bride right back there. That's Lydia. As, I, as they would say in some tradition, she's the first lady. First so there lady. we go. Yes. Yes. The only lady. That's right. She, you better be yeah, the that's first, right. okay. first yeah. and last and only, lady. Yeah, right. All right. So the reason I've invited Eric up here, for those of you who know, uh, we have invited Eric just recently to join our staff in a full-time capacity as our associate pastor. Incredibly excited already about what he's been able to do. He has a tremendous love for the church. And I don't just mean this church, but the big C, the universal church. And that's part of the thing that attracted us to his gifts and talents. Um, Adam Oxford was fantastic for the first yes, three years, built a, a great foundation for us. Eric's job is to come and build on that foundation. So talk a little bit about what that looks like and where you and I have been talking about yeah, this yeah. goes from here. Yeah, I think uh, some, I'm going to be tasked with a few things. Number one would be some leadership, leadership development, just being able to help sort that out as we continue to grow and expand. Um, two is our community inside and outside, so community awareness and we we can uh, be able to touch lives with each other personally. We're going to be starting up and ramping, on-ramping life groups, which will be our throughout the week opportunities for people to break this kind of community down into sizable home-like fellowships where you eat, fellowship, break bread, have conversations, encourage each other. And then just missional thinking. Um, as you would think globally, we should act uh, locally yes. and vice versa. And so we want to get around that idea. Be a sending church all the time. And the mission of God is something that's dynamic for us to do. So hoping to get behind all those. And great group of people that are already pretty much in the place, man. I'm just feeling like I'm coming mm -hmm. in with an A-team yep. and just like doing, doing work alongside of that and working alongside of this guy and helping him where I can, sweep his floor, vacuum, whatever that might be. Um, <laughs> And do some biblical counseling with him and, yeah. and then just see where we Sleeping go. Sleeping floor, biblical counseling. Something like that. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, we are very blessed to have Eric in the sense that he has come to us with 30 plus years of ministry experience. So it's not like you have to train a guy like this. You just ask him to step in and start immediately using his gifts. And I'm very thankful for that. So what is the thing that excites you most about Grove Hill and the potential that is here with this congregation? I'm just excited that in, a, in time we're just going to get to know you. You know who you are. Uh, my wife and I are one of our loves is being hospitable out of our home. Um, uh, we find that our house and our home and our family is really the mission expression of how we can reach our neighborhoods and our communities. And so, just grateful that that can be an opportunity for us. And just know that uh, we want to get to know you. It's going to take a lot uh, for us to just remember names. So I was uh, mentioning to one lady in the second service. I said, "Hey, just." Quiz me. It's okay. Don't make me look like a failure every Sunday that I don't remember your name, but quiz me and introduce yourself to us and, and just be praying for us as well. I mean, and that picture that He's you see He's got his up own there. small group at home, so yeah. you can be praying for him. Yeah. I mean, when we roll into town, Ridley, I mean, we just make a ruckus. And so, uh, in <laughs> fact, like one of the things I would tell you is like, if you come to our house, you're a visitor maybe at the threshold, then you're a survivor when you get through. <laughs> so just you, right? You just... My kids know that, especially if you're playing spoons, we'll make you sign a waiver. Um, <laughs> but up there, you just got all the kids, um, and we, we miss them. We love them. We're going to go back and see them. I get to perform a wedding for one of my sons, get to preach at my former church to encourage them in the gospel, get to just uh, rekindle some relationships, probably try to take a video of some kind and send it back this way and say, hey, this is what, you know, Callie, what's up, Tennessee, and try to bridge those two. I look forward to, when you talk about church pastor i look forward to seeing even the church that i got to pastor for 15 years syncing up in relationship yeah. with this church absolutely. and how that thread absolutely can just get tight and be able to just see each other but yeah just be praying for them be praying for us as we transition 
excited to uh, just get busy, just kind of get busy. I know that you guys are going to give us a little bit of time away, so appreciate yep. that. Yep, so we, what we want to do now is we want to take an opportunity to pray for him as he begins his ministry here. Uh, he just mentioned that they're going to be gone. I wanted to make sure he mentioned that because I don't want you to think we kicked him out like tomorrow no. and he's yeah, gone. No. Yeah. Uh, they're going to be gone for the next three weeks, I think uh, it is. Ish, ish. Three ish ish. Uh, to do a wedding, to do some preaching, those kinds of things, to see family, and then, of course, he'll come back and hit the ground running with yep. us. Yep. Uh, we've already been talking about some really cool things that I'm yep. personally excited about. Uh, once again, just building off of everything that Adam established for us and excited yep. about the days ahead. Yep. As we get ready to do this, this is also part of what we know as our Unreached People Group time. As yep. you know, we have been praying for the Butu Ningi, so if you want to speak yeah, to that just a little quick. bit. So, real quick, so that little country right there of Nigeria... Great place. I've been there, served there, did the Jesus Film Project just below the Butu people. We were in Jos, Abuja, came into Logos and stuff. So an amazing place to serve and be a part of God's community. If God's ever calling you, would you do yourself a big favor? Don't hide that. Mm -hmm. Talk that through. Come and talk to me. I would love to hear more about what maybe God is laying on your heart for a global mission expression. We're going to get some more of that with Julie and the other mission people to just get more involved in this but let's pray for the Butu people because I can tell you from when I went to now the political unrest the spiritual unrest just to be a Christian mm -hmm. is hard Amen. and so for those who mm -hmm. are going to be standing for Christ in a place like that we need to cover them with the spirit of God so that they would just be courageous each and every day as they're in yeah. their community so. so let's take a second to pray for Eric as he begins his ministry as we pray for the Bluetooth people and, of course, pray for today's message as we get ready to uh, continue our worship. Father, we thank you for my friend, my brother in Christ, Lord. I thank you for the call you placed on his life so long ago and that today he remains faithful in that call. I pray for he and his wife and his kids as they travel back to California to see and be with friends and family, Lord, and then as they return here to what is now their mission field. I pray that you would use their family in mighty ways, that you would help them in the small transitions and the large ones, Lord, that are going to take place. I pray that you continue day by day to give him a fresh vision for where you want this congregation to be and that he and I and the rest of our staff would be on the same page as we lead this congregation into whatever the next stage is hold for this, this church. We are thankful that there are people in this world who speak truth to others, who share the gospel. And so, Lord, we are praying right now that you would send some of those people to these Butu yes. uh, people, Lord, that they would hear the gospel, that they would understand it through their language, Lord, and in their culture, and they would be able to receive what is the most precious gift the world has ever seen. I pray for a church, a little town, a little church that's going to the world, Lord, that we would always keep that in front of us, Father, as our challenge and our task, and that we would be faithful to follow through with that. Now, Lord, as we turn our heart to your word, I pray that you would bring it alive in us and for us so that we may live it this week. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, brother. Love you very much. All right, if you got your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to tell you as you're doing that, one of the challenges of having three worship services is that the first two, you kind of have to hurry because you have to get things done, and we have had to do that today. So because you're in the 1030 service, you don't have that problem, which means you get the hour and a half version of the sermon that I've been rushing through all morning. Just kidding. I won't make you do that. We'll have you out of here at dinner time. All right, Genesis chapter 1. We started this series last week on the family. We specifically started with godly manhood because we believe and see that God has laid out the plan of life that God wanted men to be the leaders for their homes, the leaders for their families, their churches, their communities. That does not in any way diminish the role of women. In fact, what I want to do today is spend some time talking about and affirming the promises that God has for women. This is really, really important because we live in a culture today that diminishes the value of women, that degrades women, in many cases abuses women, and makes them feel like they are not worth what they really are in God's eyes. Um, men who have power abuse women. Uh, pornography and abuse are in the news every single day. And I think the Bible has a lot to say to this and about this. Unfortunately, the world and even many of our churches believe that the message is an antiquated one, that it no longer applies. And I think that's because they're reading the Bible incorrectly, if they're reading it at all. And sad to say, I believe there's even some pastors who really haven't done a whole lot of digging into this. 
So what I want to do is I want to take us on a journey through Scripture. I'm going to pull out nine affirmations for women of all stages of life, all places in life today. Uh, I want to give you the same warning that I gave the ladies last week. I want to give it to the men. Don't tune out and believe that this doesn't apply to you because the truth is the reason that women have many of the problems that they have is because men are like we are, right? I mean, that would be a great time for a chorus of women to just stand and say amen, you know? You know? So here's the reality. The Bible does have a lot to say. We're going to speak to all of those things. Women, I want you to know and hear and understand what God thinks about you and how he values you. Men, I hope you can learn some lessons, not only about yourself, but about your relationship with the women in your life. And I don't want you to just think husband and wife, because as we have pulled these together, like I said, we're talking about women at all stages and all places. That's why we use the word womanhood, not being a wife or being a mother, even though we will address some of those things today, okay? All right, so hang on. It won't be as fast as it's been the first two services, but I do want to make uh, good use of your time this morning as we look to God's Word about these affirmations in the Bible. First of all, to every woman in the room, I want you to know that you are dignified and distinguished. You are dignified and distinguished. Genesis 126 says, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. God's Word says you are distinguished because you were made according to a perfect design. This cuts through a lot of the lies that our culture has given us. Your dignity as a woman, regardless of where you are or what background you come out of, your dignity does not depend on your physical appearance. It does not depend on your career or the amount of income you bring into your family. It does not depend on your marital status, and it definitely does not depend on the opinions of others in your life. Your dignity, your love, your value comes because God has created you, and that's enough. In fact, I think we're teaching a wrong perspective in our churches today because we're teaching people that because you are valuable, God loves you, and nothing could be further from the truth. You are valuable because God loved you first. God doesn't love you because you're valuable. You are valuable because God loves you. And the reason that's important is because when you understand that God loved you regardless of what you considered your value, then you don't have to work to earn your dignity. Your dignity's already been granted to you as a human being. Now, I could sit here and say the same thing about the men, and that's the purpose of what I'm trying to say to you. At the foot of the cross, all people are equal. At the foot of the cross, all people are equal. Now, what that doesn't mean is it doesn't mean that we were created to do the same things or be the same kind of people. God, in all of his awesomeness, his power, his creativity, created 7 billion plus people on this planet, and all of them are unique for a reason. Think about it. If you looked at the person next to you and they were exactly like you in every way, then one of you would be a waste of space, right? You'd just be duplicating the work of somebody else. But God created you uniquely with a unique personality, unique gifts, unique um, uh, talents and resources that you bring to the table. So all of us, male and female, are equal before God. And we possess equal dignity. Despite what the culture tells you, God did not invent gender-neutral people. They were created male and female. Why is that important? Well, this past week, believe it or not, article, a group of scientists somewhere living in the land of ignorance, <laughs> spoke up and said that the idea that biology determines your sex is an antiquated idea. It's antiquated, in other words, it's outdated. We must embrace the understanding that there are more than a hundred different genders. At which point, my question is, what planet are the other 98 living on? Because I've been around, the world's been around for thousands of years, and somehow we managed with male and female all along, and we understood the value of that. We believe that they, male and female were created by God for a purpose, for a reason. Amen? amen? All right, be careful where you amen, because every single one of you just amen me, because you believe that God in His holiness and His perfection created male and female, Right? Well, if you acknowledge that, then you also must acknowledge you that the way God created you is perfect. Never look in the mirror and say, I wish I was a man or I wish I was a woman. Never look in the mirror and say, I wish I was taller, shorter, 
more lean, more fit, more could sing better, could talk better. When you do that, you literally look in the face of the God who created you and say, you made a mistake. When you say that, you do not believe in the God of the Bible. Understand that. That's important. So, Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, to combat the lies of Satan, it says, God saw all that. Everybody say, all that. that. Now, say it like a Tennessean. All that. There you go. God saw all that, you all, he had made, and it was very good indeed. The reason I wanted to emphasize that in this passage of Scripture is because some of you right now are going, yeah, God made everybody good but me. You know, I'm the exception. I'm the, I'm the exception to the rule. There is no exception. All that he saw, all that he made, he said it's very, very good. And that's a, a huge reminder. The quintessential passage on godly womanhood comes from Proverbs 31, right? Some of you have pictures of it at home. You have it crocheted and stuck on your refrigerator. You got portions of it, you know, you know. I know, I don't even know what I'm talking about. Anyway, <laughs> God and men and women were created differently. Uh, you've put memes up about it. How about that? Is that a better way to put it? You, you value this Proverbs 31. If you go back and study it carefully, you will notice that it very seldom mentions physical appearance. In other words, godliness is not based on the external and exterior of who we are. It's based on what comes from the end. That's what you offer back to God. It's the importance of understanding our esteem and significance do not come from the things that the world measure. If you stand in a grocery store line for any length of time, you'll get all the lies fed to you, right? Vogue, Essence, Esquire, all those magazines are throwing this idea out there that if you don't have a certain measurement, a certain gift, a set of skills, whatever, if you don't have all the physical things, then you somehow just don't measure up. And that's a lie that Satan would love to feed women, and he does day after day after day. Now, men... If you are blessed to be married to a woman and she doesn't, let me, let me put it this way. If you wake up on any given day and your wife does not hear from you how much you love her, then you're missing a chance to be God to her. They need to hear from you on a daily basis that they are loved and valued for who they are and not what you wish they would be. Secondly, to every wife, you are an invaluable treasure. You're an invaluable treasure. Genesis chapter 2, just one chapter over from where we were, it says, Then the Lord God said, It's not good for a man to be alone. And you know why he said that? Because when men are alone, we get into trouble, don't we? Amen. Right? It says, It's not good for the man to be alone. I'm going to make a helper corresponding to him. Skip to verse 21. It says, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his, with his wife, and they become one flesh. Two things I want you to see there. Number one, good things happen when men take naps, so ladies leave them alone. I'm, I'm just kidding. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's not what it said. The real thing I want you to see is this, that from the beginning, God's plan has always been a man and a woman living in a complementary life, okay? Men were created out to carry out certain functions. Women were created to carry out certain functions. None of them is more valuable than the other. I would say that if you are any place where men are thought to be better than women, then you are in a place that is against the design of God as it was intended to be. If you have ever been in a church situation where you felt like that you as a woman were not valuable to that church or to the kingdom of God, I apologize to you because that is evil. It's not just bad. It's evil. It is evil for any person created in the image of God to believe that they are anything less valuable than the person standing next to them. By the same time, we should never have the arrogance to believe that we are more valuable than anybody else on this planet. God sees us all with equal eyes. He created us to need each other. Now, one other thing that's really important here is to understand that we don't have the right to redefine what God has already defined. In Genesis, we read the story where God defined marriage as one man, one woman, for life, flesh on flesh, leaving the father and mother and joining together as one. That is marriage. For decades, our culture has tried to redefine marriage as many other things. It will be unsuccessful to the end of time because only God has permission to define marriage. Only God. And we must understand that. 
He defines marriage this way for a reason. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Paul's writing to the church of Ephesus. He's been talking about marriage in this chapter, and he gets to the end of it. He says, this mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. The mystery he's referring to is the mystery of marriage. The mystery of marriage. You see, God designed marriage so that a man's love for his wife is a pure reflection of Christ's love for his church. And by the same token, a woman's respect for her husband reflects the same respect and honor that the church has for Jesus Christ. Simply put, marriage was meant to be a reflection of the relationship between Jesus and the universal church. And it's a beautiful image that we should gratefully embrace. Number three, to mothers and grandmothers, God uses your life in ways you cannot imagine. He uses you in ways that you cannot imagine. You know, many women in Scripture are honored for their roles, but I want to to specifically target a couple right here in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul is writing to Timothy, who's his young protege, the guy who's going to eventually become a pastor of some of the churches and travel on some of the journeys along with Paul, the missionary journeys. And he says to him, I recall your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I'm convinced is in you also. Be very careful here. He says, I recall your sincere faith. So he's telling Timothy, this is your faith. You have to own it. You can't live out your mom's or your grandmother's or your dad's. It's your faith to live out. But he is acknowledging that the faith that Timothy received came through a mother and a grandmother who lived an example before him and invested their lives in him. If you know the story of Timothy from Acts chapter 16, we know that Timothy's dad was Greek and most likely was not a believer himself. So when it came to the idea of discipling Timothy, this responsibility fell on the lives of both Lois and Eunice. I want you to be reminded today, mothers and grandmothers, God uses you in ways that you cannot measure. You can't sit down and just estimate how valuable it is for a mother to sit at the breakfast table with her child and talk about Jesus. You can't underestimate the power of a grandmother who takes a child in the middle of a thunderstorm and embraces him and prays with him to a God that may not be seen but definitely can be known. This is a powerful, powerful thing. The Bible isn't clear about what role women should have outside of the home, about careers and working outside the home. I'm here to tell you it's my personal belief that women should be working outside the home if they feel led to do so. If they have gifts and talents they want to, that's another way that God spreads the gospel. But only if God leads you to that decision yourself. I don't want you working outside the home if you feel like you are pressured to do that by a culture that says being a mother is not enough. That is a lie. I also, and this is important, last week we talked about how the primary role of a father is to disciple his children by putting the seeds of the gospel in his life. I also believe that it is a mother's role to come alongside that husband and reaffirm and re-encourage those messages in the life of the child. So if your work outside of the home prevents you from being the mother you need to be at home, quit your job. Quit your job. Now be very careful. Some of you went to the sleep on the first part. Now you're going to go home and tell everybody, he says women shouldn't work. That is not what I said. I said that if your work is causing your children to miss out on the discipleship that needs to be taking place in their home, then you need to pray really hard about whether God really wants you working outside of the home. And I'm always very careful to say work outside of the home. Because if you've ever tried to be a mother, inside the home is enough work for anyone. And I can say that because I was a single dad for three and a half years. I know what it's like to try to balance all those things. I know what it's like to try to spend equal amounts of time investing in two children as opposed to one and trying to do all the things that you know you got to do outside the home and yet get home and do all the important things that need to happen inside the home. But the Bible does say we should value what we do in the home because it is the most important investment we will ever make. And you cannot for a minute devalue the love of a mother or a grandmother for their child and the difference it can make in their lives, their self-esteem, their understanding of their purpose, etc. Now, if you're a single mother here today, regardless of the reason that you are single, whether it's death, divorce, separation, or maybe you've just got a pound of flesh living in your house that doesn't participate in the home. Yeah. I heard a word. What would you say? Oh, or you got dumped. Yeah. You, what? That was a more modern vernacular for what I was trying to say. 
Yes, regardless of the reason you might be a single parent, I want you to understand something. While that situation may make it more challenging to do what you do, it does not make it impossible. It does not make it impossible. Why? Because we look at the example of Lois and Eunice and realize that they were able to do that. They were able to do that. Now, look around you for just a second. You are amongst family here. When you look around this room, we are brothers and sisters in Christ for a reason. If you're feeling weighed down by the pressure of being a single parent, whether it's a mom or a dad, if you feel like you are against overwhelming odds and trying to invest in your children and love your children and train your children, hear this from me. This is a church that will come alongside you and love you and walk this journey with you. If it's a break that you need because you've got it all on your shoulders, then we'll find somebody to give you a break and take care of those children for a little while. If it's help with discipling a child that maybe is a little unruly, we stand ready to help invest in you, to, to take care of those children with you, to give you wisdom and accountability, and if we have to, we'll help you tie them down. Sometimes that's necessary. No, I'm just kidding. Don't go home and practice that on your children, okay? They'll be calling me this week from family services because I suggested such a thing. So, God uses your life in ways you cannot imagine. Number four, to single women in this congregation, God is your sufficiency and your fulfillment. You are not incomplete because you do not have a man. Now, once again, we like to amen that in the church, but we are some of the world's worst about seeing a 15-year-old kid and going, do you have a boyfriend or girlfriend? You hear that, 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 the expectation that's set by that question? Or even worse, 25-year-old guy walks in and goes, you're not married yet? Or you got a woman in your future? Just once I would love for a 12-year-old to look at a, an adult who asked that question and say, mm, I don't have a boyfriend because I don't need a boyfriend. I've got what I need in Jesus Christ. If God chooses to bring me a man, if God chooses to bring me a woman, then praise God for that. But I don't have to have that to be complete. I don't have to have that to have satisfaction in my life. A hundred years ago in the United States, 90% of the adults who lived in this country were married. 90%, which basically meant if you were an adult, you were married. Even if you got divorced or lost a spouse to death, you almost immediately got remarried because it was just kind of the expectation, as well as it was almost a survival thing because you needed two incomes to kind of make things work in those days. A hundred years later today, the statistic is that almost 48% of adults are actually married. And men and women are waiting longer to get married today. And what that means is that as the church, we once again have to be very, very careful to remind those people when they come in the doors to our church, those people who live in those particular situations, you are valued and worth everything we have just like anybody else. You are family here, we love you, we care for you, and we don't care what your future outcome is, we don't care what your past is, you are a dignified person because of your relationship with God as a bearer of his image. So keep that in mind. One of the problems we have is that in the Christian bookstores, when you go pick up a book that relates to marriage, it typically talks about all the problems that marriages have, right? Right? communication, sexual issues, financial issues, all those different things. By the same token, when you pick up a book on singleness, what you read in most Christian books is singleness is something that's to be endured until you find the right guy, right? Both of those are wrong images. That's not what the Bible portrays for us. In fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 8 says, I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain as I am. That singleness can be a gift and is a gift for those who choose to embrace it and live it out for God's purposes. By remaining single, the single person has the ability to focus single-handedly on a relationship with Christ and how they can serve that, their Savior. Don't let singleness make you think you don't have a place in our family here. Some of the great heroes of the faith were single people. John the Baptist, Mary of Magdala. Lydia, most believe, most scholars believe that Paul himself was a single person. And let's not forget that Jesus himself never married, never pursued a relationship with a woman in that way. Singleness does not discriminate against you and it does not eliminate you from being used. Number five, to the barren woman, God is your all-powerful and all-wise hope. 
There are some of you here today who struggle with this issue of trying to have a child or maybe to have another child. But it's interesting to see how common barrenness was among women of faith in the Bible. If you think back, Sarah, Abraham's wife, was 90 years old before she had a child. Isaac's wife, Rebecca, Jacob's wife, Rachel. First Samuel, we read about Hannah who wept year after year, pleading that God would bless her with the child. Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary, longed for a child before she had John the Baptist. This journey is familiar to some couples in our church, and I just want you to know that we are with you and for you and praying in these situations that God's best for you be done. If you are struggling to have children, remember this. God is all-powerful. He is all-powerful. These stories in Scripture that we read happen to increase the faith of these women and their husbands. Once again, go back and think about the women I talked about and how close they were to God because of the way they poured their spirit out to God in prayer and leaned on Him through these difficult seasons in their life. In Psalm 113, 9, we see this. It says, He gives the childless woman a household, making her the joyful mother of children. The question you might ask after reading that is, well, if God can do this, then why doesn't He do it all the time? Well, not only is God all-powerful, but God is also all-wise. Infertility can lead you to trust God's power and wisdom in a way you wouldn't otherwise. God works in ways that we don't understand, that we can't comprehend. In fact, many of the questions we have in life will not receive answers until the day we walk inside of heaven. I cannot stand here and tell you how your story will turn out, but I can remind you that God is both wise and good, always good so even if god never opens your womb and blesses you with the child i will remind you that god always gives you hope look at isaiah 54 1 it says rejoice childless one who did not give birth burst into song and shout you who have not been in labor for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of the married woman says the lord Scholars disagree on exactly what this means in Scripture, but I take it to mean one thing, and that is this, that even if you never have a natural-born child to you, if you're never blessed with that opportunity, you can be a blessing and be blessed in many other ways that are made available to you. As a congregation that stands stands unapologetically as a pro-life congregation that does not believe in abortion, We must stand with open hands, open arms, open hearts, and open homes to the possibility of adoption and fostering. Because if we're going to stand here and tell people they have no right to take children, we also must stand for the responsibility that we must take them when they are not wanted. We cannot condemn the world for not doing its part if we aren't willing to do our part. And so what God says through Isaiah may be to you, you know what? In my wisdom, I choose not to give you your own child through birth, but I choose to give you your own child through a choice. And that matters just as much to the child who is in need. To the widow, God is your faithful provider. He's your faithful provider. He has given clear instructions all the way through the Bible for your care. In the Old Testament, he commanded that everyone would provide for widows and orphans. In fact, he said this is really good religion is when you take care of those who are not able to stand on their own and without the company of others. So he encourages you to take care of them. In the New Testament, he took that that responsibility off the nation of Israel and instead put it on the church itself. And he commanded the church that it was their job to honor and take care of widows. James, in his book, says that true religion is found in looking after widows. In other words, put your actions where your mouth is. Do what you have professed. In Psalm 68, 5, God called himself the widow's champion. In Psalm 146, 9, he called her his helper. And in Jeremiah 49, 11, he called himself the one that the widow can trust. Those of you who are widows today... Let me just reaffirm for you that you are not a burden to us. We love you. We love you. And we understand that it is our responsibility as the church to treat you just like the rest of our family. To care for you when you hurt. To help you when you have need. To stand alongside of you in the darkest points of your journey. We want to be your family. To the hurting. Some of you feel broken, abandoned, and alone in here today. In fact, 
you've been here week after week, and as I try to look you in the eye, you look away because you feel like you just aren't worth anything. And I would just tell you that's a lie from Satan. It absolutely is a lie from Satan. You might be asking yourself the question, God, does God even know my predicament or does he really even care? I would remind you of Psalm 56, 8 that says, You yourself have recorded my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? The psalmist reminds us that God knows every sleepless night you've ever had. He's recorded every tear you've ever cried. He knows the anxious moments that keep you awake at night, and he knows the struggles that you face. If you feel like you're failing as a mom, a wife, or a woman, I encourage you, don't look to the world for answers, but look to God and his church to help you. Maybe the problem is you spent too much time on social media with social media telling you that every other family is perfect, every other child does everything they're supposed to, everybody else has perfect vacations, perfect dinners, perfect birthday celebrations. Their world is just perfect, and that's perfectly a lie. Do not compare yourself to what goes on social media. The problem is that when you start to believe that you're falling short in any of these areas, you have sin and shame and guilt piled on you that you do not need to have. And what happens is when that becomes a reality in your life, you start to go deeper and deeper into depression and frustration. One woman comes to mind. Her name is Rahab. If you know the story of Rahab, she was a prostitute. But God saw her as something redeemable, something worthy, something that he could use. So he used this prostitute to not only rescue the nation of Israel in its battle to take the city of Jericho, which is a fascinating story in and of itself. But if you read the Gospels and read closely the lineage of David and Jesus Christ himself, you learn that Rahab was a descendant or an ancestor of Jesus Christ. It was through her lineage that Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, would come. I think the message there for all of us is this. God says to each one of you, do not declare unworthy what I have declared worthy. Do not declare broken that which I have redeemed and claimed for myself. And do not ever question the worth of any human being, no matter what your reasoning may be. Number eight, to those facing the impossible, I will remind you today that God is your strength. If you feel like you can't do it all, that's good because you can't. If your life is hard and you feel like everything in life is too difficult, let me remind you of the words of the angel to Mary. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. You may be thinking, you know, on my own, I can't do what God has called me to do, whether that's to be a wife, a mother, a career woman, whatever it is. You may say, you know what, on my own, I can't do this. You're absolutely right. You can't. But the good news of the gospel is that he never asked us to do that. He's never asked us to do one thing on our own, but always in the company of his presence, the strength of his will and his spirit in our lives, and the encouragement of other believers around us to walk this journey with us. Lastly, to all women of God, to all women of God, everybody in here, the youngest to the oldest, do not underestimate your role in making God known to the world. Think of the women God used in the Bible to display his goodness and his glory. You have people like Abigail, Deborah, Ruth, and Esther. You have women who helped establish the early church like Lydia, Phoebe, Priscilla, Euodius, and countless others who were early founding members of the congregations that we read about in the book of Acts. And because of their hard work and their leadership, along with the men who served in those churches, we had the foundations of the church that we have today. Do not underestimate your abilities. You see, what we have in the, in the modern culture is a misunderstanding of how radical Christianity was for women in the first century. If you look in the first century and prior to that, whether it's the Hebrew tradition, the Babylonian tradition, the Greeks, the Romans, women were considered to be a little bit less than a slave. In fact, for most of them in their traditions, a woman could not be seen outside the home unaccompanied by another man who was a part of the family. A wife could not inter interact with other males if she was seen in public talking to a man who was not her husband, she could be put to death or at the very least considered to be dishonorable in her behavior. A husband could divorce a woman publicly if he saw her without a veil on her face. 
This is the kind of things that existed in that day. But Jesus arrives on the scene and he contradicts the culture that he lives in. He flips the world upside down and he begins to give value and worth to these women. He says to them, you are just as important in the eyes of my father as any other man. You're just as important to me in the kingdom of God, the role you will play. And I want you to understand how you are valued by my father. Let me just close by saying this. Do not underestimate the role God has given you to play. Do not believe the lies of a culture that wants to contradict everything that God's trying to instill of you. Do not believe the distortions of the Bible that are out there in our culture. And be reminded day after day as you look in the mirror that you are a prize that is to be praised. Your value does not come from what you give to God. Your value comes from what God has already given you. Trust his word. It'll never fail you. We're going to enter into a time of communion now. The Lord's Supper is our last act of worship this morning. For those of you who are new to our congregation, I'll let you know that we practice what is known as open communion here. That means if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you have a relationship with him, we invite you to join us in participating in this moment. If you are not a follower of Christ, we invite you just to sit and observe in this moment because we believe that part of the command of doing this is that this is just for believers in Christ Jesus. So this is an opportunity for us to sit and reflect on the sacrifice that Christ has made on our behalf. Our guys are going to come now. They're going to uh, hand out the elements. As they're doing that, I want to encourage you that the scripture says, do not enter into this time in a, a callous way. You need to reflect on the condition of your heart in this moment. You need to understand where you stand before the Father. You need to reflect on any sin that might be in your life and take time to confess and repent of that sin. And if there's any broken relationships with anyone inside this room, now is the time to deal with that. As those elements are being dispersed, just take a moment to reflect on yourself in this moment. Bible records that on the night that Jesus was betrayed by Judas and turned over to the Roman soldiers and eventually to the Pharisees, that Jesus and his disciples gathered in an upper room for an opportunity to observe what was known as the Passover feast, the Hebrew tradition that honored the deliverance of sl from slavery out of Egypt by the Hebrew people by God. In that moment, there was an opportunity for, for God to introduce some new thoughts, some final teachings to his disciples. And one of those centered around this very meal and what was about to happen in his life. He said to them as he took that bread that night and broke it into pieces, that this is a representation of my body which is about to be broken for you. It's going to be beaten, it's going to be bruised, it's going to be torn, and it's going to be eventually nailed to a cross. And I'm doing this all for you. From now throughout the rest of time as the church gathers to remember this moment, he said as you take this bread and eat it, remember this is my body broken for you. Take and eat.
Then the Bible records that as part of the feast, he stood, he offered a glass of wine to those who were there to participate in the feast. As he reflected on that glass, he said to them, listen guys, this is a representation of my blood. The Bible tells us without the spilling of blood, there is no covering for sin. There is no remission of sin. Blood must be spilled in order to pay the price. Tonight, I will give the ultimate sacrifice. The old covenant that existed for thousands of years, that bought us time, is now no longer a part of this. I came to give you a new covenant, one that says that my blood will be enough for you. You just simply must believe that it does what it said it would do. That it covers your sin, it removes the guilt and the shame, and gives you an opportunity to live in a free and right relationship with my Father. So he lifted that cup. He said to them, as you take and drink, remember me. We're going to take just a second now to respond to this sermon this morning because as we talked about these different stages and places for women in this world and the affirmations we want to give them, something may have touched your heart. For some of you women, it may have described where you are, the season you're in right now, and maybe you just want to come and kneel before the Father and pray. Some of you may just want to come and thank God that He has taken you through a season of life and that you know these promises to be real because you've experienced them. Guys, maybe some of you are reminded that you play a role as the cheerleader in your wife's life. You should be her biggest fan. You should be the one who encourages her, who helps her, who holds her accountable, who stands with her in all situations. And so maybe today is the day that you want to come and you want to stand before this church and recommit yourself to that. As we stand here, as we sing this morning, if God is speaking to you about any of those things, I encourage you to pray, to pray about God's, what God is speaking to you. Let's stand as we sing.